Hello, Christchurch ladies. It's me again. I am excited to be joining you, sharing uh, this past week's message with you. Um, I am so thankful for those of you who are getting to join me on Friday nights at 730. I hope some of the rest of you can as well. We're having a great time um, talking and going through the scriptures and enjoying the word of God. We would love to have y'all join us. Um, so this past week, we talked about um, nonconformity and that Christ has called us not to conform. And so then the next week, what we talked about was um, if we're not to conform to the ways of this world, what are we to conform to? And the Bible's very clear about that. So I'm excited to share this message about um, following Christ's example with you today. So let's uh, open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just praise you and thank you for who you are. I pray that you would be with each one of the ladies listening here today. I pray that you would guide them and help them in all that they're going through. Give them a peace that passes all understanding, Lord. And I just pray that you would um, touch their hearts, touch their minds, touch their lives, and uh, meet them where they are. You know what each one of them needs. And I just pray that you would be with her and walk with her in all ways and in all things. In Jesus' precious name we pray. I also ask that you would guide this message today and have it um, have each lady hear exactly the message that you have for her. And I, I praise you for that, Lord. I praise you because you love us so intimately and so individually. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right, so um, we're going to get started here and uh, go through this message. And um, like I said, we're going to be discussing today, if we're not supposed to conform to the world's ways, what are we to conform to? And the reality is that we are called to live a life for Christ and to also be like Christ. We are called to follow his example. But what does that mean to us? So last week, when we looked at conformity, it's very clear that the Bible, in, in the Bible, that God does not want us to conform to the standards of this world and its ways. But we also looked at a series of studies that show that humans are actually surprisingly inclined to be conformists. We have a strong tendency to copy or imitate the behaviors of others around us. However, God calls us to be different. He calls us to be completely opposite of the world around us, not imitators of the world. Just as he called the Israelites to avoid adopting the immoral practices of the nations around them. He didn't want that for them. He wanted something so much better. In Leviticus 18, 2 through 5, it explains Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. I am the Lord your God, so do not act like the people of Egypt, where you used to live, or like the people of Canaan, where I am taking you. You must not imitate their way of life. You must obey all of my regulations and be careful to obey my decrees, for I am the Lord your God. If you obey my decrees and my regulations, you will find life through them. I am the Lord. God was not giving these rules to the people of Israel to restrict the people, but rather to give them true life. The New Testament has the same message for believers today. Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, and what is perfect, and what is acceptable. So what then? If we are not to conform to the world, and yet conformity comes so easily and naturally to us, what are we to do? The Word of God tells us exactly what we should do. God does call us to conform to something. We are to be imitators 
of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Ephesians 18, 1 through 2, be imitators of God, therefore as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant and sacrificial offering to God. Wow, be imitators of God, be imitators of Christ. That can seem so overwhelming, but I have good news. We do not have to accomplish this just in our own strength or on our own accord. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That's good news. It's good news because we are not responsible to do all of it ourselves. And yet, we are clearly required to be involved in the process. It doesn't just happen while, we're, while we sleep. It can't happen by osmosis while we carry the Bible around. We need to actively walk in step with God and with what God wants to do in us for us, to us, and through us. Ezekiel 18.31 says, Cast away from you all your transgressions which you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. And so we are personally called to be involved in the process. Ephesians 4.17-24 through 24 says, With the Lord's authority I say this, no longer live as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. The mind, their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But this isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus, you have learned the truth that comes from him. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. God provides several things to help us accomplish this. I'm reading the fourth book of the Prince Warriors series by Priscilla Schreier with the kids right now. It's a great series that helps the kids really grasp some, some serious scriptural truths. Hence, there are some phrases that are so ingrained in the text of the book that each time I begin to say one, the kids can actually finish the statement in unison. One such statement is, you have everything you need. And in fact, I can safely declare to you that Christ has given all of us everything we need for transformation to be accomplished in and through us. This concept is found so many places in the Bible. Let's just glance at one of them. 2 Peter 1, 2-4 says, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. Through these he has given us his precious and magnificent promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature now that you have escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. Revisit what verse 3 there says. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through, knowledge, through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. That is such a beautiful picture because he has not left us wanting or lacking for anything. So today, I just want to take 
the time to talk about just four of these basic things. There's way more than that, but I just want to talk about four of the basic things that God has gifted to us, his beloved, his beloved called children to conform our hearts and our minds and our spirits to his ways. The first one is obviously salvation. Without salvation, there can be no transformation. And salvation is a gift from God. But it's a gift that we have to accept. When we admit that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and then we also acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God who came to live a sinless life, giving his life so that we can be forgiven, then we are able to choose to invite Jesus into our life and to forgive us and transform us. This is a gift that he wants us to accept. He has already paid the price for it in full. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 promises, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life is begun. What a beautiful, beautiful image that is. Our old life is gone when we come to Christ and a new life has begun. Colossians 1, 21 through 22 says, And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet now he has reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. The second gift that God has given to help in the transformation process is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit teaches us and accomplishes this transformation within us as we walk with him in agreement to what he's doing. In John 16, through, uh, sorry, 16, 7, Jesus actually promises his followers this gift. As he says, and this is from the Amplified Version, However, I am telling you the truth. I am telling you nothing but the truth. When I say that it is profitable, good, expedient, advantageous for you that I go away, because if I do not go away, the comforter, counselor, helper, advocate, intercessor, strengthener, standby, will not come to you into close fellowship with you. But if I go away, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. Moreover, scripture also makes it clear that we, we get to choose whether or not we will walk in step with the Holy Spirit's guidance. In Galatians 5, 16 through 18, it says, So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Remember that verse we quoted at the beginning of all this, speaking to the Israelites, Leviticus 18.5? It says, if you obey my decrees and my regulations, you will find life through them. I am the Lord. We spend so much time, whether we're in the Old Testament or the New Testament, whether we're thinking about one or the other, we spend so much time oftentimes thinking that God is restricting us. But this verse says you will find life. He was showing them the way to life. The Holy Spirit today is showing us the way to life. If we will walk in step with him, God is actually freeing us to experience real life, real peace, real joy. Likewise, through following the Holy Spirit, it is much less about what we are losing. It's not about, in fact, what are we losing? We're losing death, sin, misery. Walking with the Holy Spirit is actually much more about the gift he is giving us. True life, real transformation, freedom, and peace. One Bible study that I did resonated with me because she said, it isn't just that we were redeemed from something. She said, the greater news is that we have been redeemed to something. God hasn't just called you out of a life of sin. 
He has called you to push forward into a life full of riches where he will richly bless you with the ability to uh, bless others, to teach others, to share the gospel, to live in a freer way where you're not bound by guilt and uh, the darkness that sin brings. This resonates in Galatians 5, through 25, where it says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. What wonderful gifts the Father gives us when we choose to stay in step with allowing the transformations that the Holy Spirit brings into our lives. The third thing that God has given us to help us in this transformation process is his word, both to guide us and to help us know him better, more intimately. The better we know him, the better we can become like him. For you can't become like anything or anyone that you don't know. 2 Timothy 3.16 teaches all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching for reproof, for corrections, and for training in righteousness. Again, the word teaches us how we can use the word itself to walk with the Lord. In Colossians 1.10, we read, So, as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of the Lord. Colossians 3, 8-11 says, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. This very concept that this verse shares of Christ being all and in all brings us to the fourth wonderful and amazing gift that God has given us to accomplish this transformation. The fourth thing that he has given us is community. And we need that community. He calls us to find ourselves in the context of that community where we can hold each other accountable and teach each other to walk in his ways. If you will allow me to use the words of someone else, I believe that Howard Macy has summarized this so well. This is what he wrote. Christian community is simply sharing a common life in Christ. It moves us beyond the self-interested isolation of private lives and beyond the superficial social contacts that pass for Christian fellowship. The biblical ideal of community challenges us instead to commit ourselves to life together as the people of God. We know all too well that maturity takes time. We know less well that it also takes our brothers and sisters in Christ. It is a process that is revealed in the each other language of the New Testament. Love one another, forgive each other, regard each other more highly than yourselves, teach and correct each other, encourage each other, pray for each other, and bear each other's burdens. Be friends with one another, kind, compassionate, and generous in hospitality. Serve one another and submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This list just scratches the surface, but it is enough to remind us that we need the community of faith to grow up in Christ. Christian community is the place of our continuing conversion. Its goal is that individually and together we should become mature no longer knocked around by clever religious hucksters, 
but able to stand tall and straight, embodying the very fullness of Christ. So let's look at that, at that fullness of Christ that he references there, because it's been our topic all evening. Fullness in Christ is our goal. That's when we're emulating who he is, who he has called us to be. Indeed, in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, it says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. And this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Did you hear those final words there? This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. And it continues on in Ephesians 4, 14 through 16, saying this, Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Again, revisit those special words in the first part of verse 15 there. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way, more and more like Christ. I want to end with this. My kids have a song that we sing for our homeschool work. It's called, He's Still Working on Me. Let me share the main part of it with you. It says, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the earth, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me. There really ought to be a sign upon my heart. Don't judge me yet. There's an unfinished part, but I'll be better just according to his plan fashioned by the master's loving hand. In the mirror of his word, reflections that I see make me wonder why he never gave up on me. But he loves me as I am and helps me when I pray. Remember, he's the potter. I'm the clay. He's still working on me to make me what I need to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me. I love the image that this song conveys because it shows that our transformation is ongoing as our relationship with God grows. 1 John 3, 2 through 3 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. I want to say that again, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself and as he is pure. It is exciting to know he is still working on us. We are his children, and we are not yet what we will be, but we shall be like him, and we shall see him as he is. This is such good news. It's exciting news. It makes me want to shout out joyfully to everyone all things are possible through Christ. Ladies, thank you for joining me for this. I hope that it has blessed you. I hope it's blessed your heart. 
Um, if it has, take a moment and reach out and let me know. If there are particular topics you want me to cover in the weeks to come, reach out and let me know that too. Feel free to message me. Um, feel free to reach out to me for prayer. I'm here for you. I love you, ladies. I miss you. I can't wait to see y'all again. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for salvation. Lord, thank you for the transformation that you give us. And thank you for community. Help us to keep that community and protect that community even during this time period when we are being forced to be apart. I pray that you would protect people's health in this time period and help each lady not deal with fear, not wrestle with fear, but help her feel safe and secure, knowing that she is resting in your arms and in your protections. I just pray that powerful peace over each woman uh, in our congregation right now, and I thank you for it. Lord, I lift up our pastors to you. I thank you for them. I thank you for their dedication. I pray that you would give them uh, peace and wisdom and knowledge and guidance and direction during this time period, and I praise you for that. Help us each to stay in step with you, Lord. We love you. We worship you in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ladies, thank you so much. I miss you. I can't wait for us to be together again. Bye-bye.